We're having too much fun off air here in our downtown Charlottesville studio. Thank you kindly for joining us on a Thursday. <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> the Island Seville Network. Today's show is presented by the Clifton and Keswick. The Clifton and Keswick guys, if you haven't been there for a dinner with someone special, you are truly, truly, truly missing out. The Clifton and Keswick has got happy hour, they got dinner, they got weddings, they got events, they got hotel. It is a special place. And it's in particular a special place. If you want to make a memory with someone that you truly, truly love, it's fine. If Liza the dog is walking around the set right now, <laughs> she escaped from her, her dog house here in the I Love Seville studio. We love Liza so much. It's completely cool. All right. Hey, Liza. Can we, do we have a Liza cam? Literally, the dog is sitting next to me looking for a pet. Can we have a Liza cam? Uh, let's see. I mean, I'm, I know this is asking a lot here, but that's all right. It's all right. She can just sit here. I don't mind. You know I love Liza. I love dogs. Um, I have a uh, rescue from Caring for Creatures that is sitting next to me as I'm hosting the talk show right now. On a Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Lisa Costello, I hope you enjoyed the uh, intro of today's program. We will do this forevermore for you. Uh, we know how much you enjoy hearing Quiet on the Set and uh, how much you enjoy um, Mics Are Going Hot and some of the behind the scenes. I think Judah's putting Eliza, oh, you do have Eliza Cam going over here. All right, let's, we'll, we'll cut to the chase. We'll cut to the chase here. We got a lot of quality um, commentary for you today. Um, I want to talk uh, um, assessments. Assessments are now starting to really um, rattle the cage of a lot of people in, in Charlottesville City and in Almaro County. I mean, it is, um, it's going to be costly, even more costly to own a home. So what Judah Wickhauer and I were planning was to try to cover the assessment chatter um, from two different perspectives. Um, Judah, uh, a homeowner in Amar County, I'm also a homeowner in Amar County, um, have a fair amount of um, investment um, in rental real estate, commercial and residential. There's Liza, the Liza cam right there. Hey, Liza. Look at the screen if you want to see the I Love Sevo mascot. This is Liza. She's a rescue from caring for creatures. She is undoubtedly the best dog in the world. Uh, Liza, sit. That's a good girl. Look at, you're famous. You're on camera. Everyone look at Liza on screen. We love her. Hey, Liza, you can sit right there. No bother. Um, why don't we welcome Judah Wickhauer in on a two-shot, and we'll flip in the Liza cam from time to time. Um, Liza, I'm spoiling her with a little back rub, a little neck rub, a little ear rub. She's quite happy. Um, somewhere I think my son may be watching the show and seeing the Liza cam and, and, and also quite happy. So, all right, we'll cut to the chase, J-Dubs. Two shot. You came up with this idea. I thought it was a good one. Um, and I think we can have this conversation um, two different ways. We can look at this from, you know, a layman's perspective and getting the reaction of, you know, someone who owns a house in the area, right? Yeah. Then we can also look at it from um, a multi-unit owner perspective um, and a, um, I don't want to call it nuanced. What's the word I'm looking for here? Um, we can uh -huh. banner back and forth on the assessment increases in Charlottesville and Almaro County, and, and I will take the other side um, for the sake of a talk show. I will cut to the chase. It's going to be quite costly for people to own, uh, continue owning real estate in this area. Um, yeah. and, and I truly believe the real estate tax rate's going to increase. And when the real estate tax rate's going to increase, that, that, that means homeowners, property owners, commercial owners, investment uh, owners are going to get hit on uh, multiple, multiple ways um, from a yeah. wallet and purse and pocketbook standpoint. Um, how about we start with this topic here? Increased real estate taxes. Are they regressive or progressive? Some folks call the um, taxes on real estate um, essentially a wealth tax. And because it's a wealth tax, it's a progressive tax. I'll try to unpack that a little bit. And, uh, I've, got, and I've got a... Uh an article from the New York, New York Times that uh, I think is the 
uh, the other side of what you're talking about. Okay, so we'll unpack it and we'll encourage you, the viewer and listener, to chime in on the discussion. If you haven't seen your assessment yet, it's up a lot. Charlottesville City and Admiral County, depending on where you live, are up double-digit percentage points. Yeah. Um, Lisa Custolo said, yes, I did. I was listening and waiting for Judah to say that. It's one of my favorite aspects of the show. Um, Scott Aaronworth said, Liza is easily the best-looking one of the groups. Scott Aaronworth, I concur. <laughs> She's my golden girl. <laughs> She's such a good dog. Liza Bean. Liza Bean, a rescue from caring for creatures in Fluvanna County. Mary Burkholz is a friend of the program, yeah. and, and Judah rescued her. Um, from this this nonprofit in Fluvanna. Um, all right, so here's here's one person's this here's one way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. A jurisdiction like Charlottesville, Almaro County, it needs money to operate. Yeah. Schools, police, roads, transportation, cleaning, employees, right. administrative staff, um, support staff planning needs money to operate yeah all the, all those cops that we need to, to hire the uh the teachers that we uh you know that we're hoping the schools uh have enough of the uh, school bus drivers school capital bus drivers. improvement projects i mean running the jurisdiction is expensive mm-hmm. you're talking 200 plus million in charlottesville city i think and, and i'd have to look right around 500 million for Albemarle county um it's expensive to operate a jurisdiction The primary driver of jurisdictional revenue in Charlottesville City and Admiral County is money taxes associated with rooftops, Um, home ownership, commercial ownership, investment, property ownership. Fluvanna County, for example, over 90% of the revenue um, in Fluvanna County comes from rooftops because Fluvanna doesn't have a business tax base. Right. I mean, all it really has is, is, is houses for the most part. Yeah, and a few small businesses. And a few small businesses. And as a result, Fluvanna County, over 90% of the jurisdictional revenue comes from um, taxes on rooftops. Almoral County and the city of Charlottesville is lower. Why Almoral County and the city of Charlottesville is lower is because we have a thriving business ecosystem. Yeah. We have a thriving um, restaurant scene. Mm -hmm. where meals taxes generate revenue. We have hotels on just about every block and lodging taxes generate revenue for the jurisdiction. Still, if you're in in Albemarle or if you're in the city of Charlottesville, if you're anywhere in Central Virginia, you're going to get really stung. Judah will, I will, all of us will come June and December when we pay our tax bills. Um, And we're going to unpack this from different perspectives. I want to talk about is the real estate tax a regressive tax or is it the fairest way to tax the wealthy in a jurisdiction, a wealth tax? Because let's cut to the chase. If you raise the meals tax at restaurants, you're going to put restaurants out of business and then you'll uh, shoot yourself in the foot. Well, even, even more simple than that. If you raise the taxes on meals at restaurants, Wealthy people go to restaurants, upper class go to we- restaurants, middle class go to restaurants, lower class go to restaurants, Every- people go to restaurants. So they're getting taxed the same way. You know, the real estate tax is taxing homeowners or property owners based on the size of their homes, the location of their homes, the amenities of their homes, and the neighborhoods they live. Um, based on comparables of what their neighbors are doing from a home ownership standpoint. Right. So if you have a huge house and you live in a Tony or prestigious neighborhood, some people say this is an equitable way to drive jurisdictional revenue because if you've got a massive crib, yeah. you're going to be paying more. Right. If you've got a smaller crib, you're going to be paying less. Mm-hmm. So some folks call it the wealth tax. Other folks like yours truly call it a regressive tax. And, and there's two different taxes, two different ways the jurisdiction makes revenue on your house. Um, a real estate assessment, which is happening now, that's based on market value. So a city assessor or a county assessor has to legitimately say, this is the market value of your house. And whether you like it or not, your home is, is, is appreciated in value. So because the ecosystem in Central Virginia is so coveted and because demand is so high and because the University of Virginia is so prestigious and continues to attract people here, the value of your home is going up. And because the value of your home is going up, 
you're going to have to pay more from a tax standpoint. And that's called fair market value. Like the personal property taxes last year, when the used car market went out of control, yeah. people were calling the um, commissioner of revenue, Todd Divers, and saying, commissioner, what the hell is going on here? My used car year over year jumped 35%. This isn't fair. The commissioner says, I, I can't help that. The used car market's out of control. I can't control what the used car market is doing. Yeah. And, and you're taxed on the fair market value of your, of your whip, of your Explorer, of your, of your Ford, of your Mercedes, of your truck, whatever it may be. He legitimately can't control that. What the jurisdiction can control is the tax rate. They can control the tax rate. They can choose not to raise it. So I want to take a deep dive on this in a friendly conversational setting. Is it a regressive tax? Is it a wealth tax? Is it the definition of gentrifying the community and making it homogenous and wealthy? Mm -hmm. How do we manage this? Do we expand the, real, the tax relief program? Do we... Um, consider other nuanced methods to help alleviate burdens on homeowners. Yeah. What is the future of Charlottesville if year after year homeowners are having to pay more and more and more and more on taxes with their house? And if that happens, is it just going to create a community that, frankly speaking, is extremely wealthy and homogenous? That's the question we'll talk about today. So I'll stop. I want to hear your thoughts on this. We'll banter back and forth. And I think we're going to offer a topic matter that you guys truly will enjoy today on a Thursday. My friend, the show is yours. So looking around, I found this article on, uh, <clears throat> on how lower income Americans get cheated on property taxes. And uh, the, uh, they're alleging that uh, many homeowners are paying a total of billions of dollars extra because of an inequities in assessing property values. And cite your source. This is the New York Times. Yeah, New York Times. This is uh, an opinion piece. Um, and it talks about how uh, uh, the, flat, the flat rate property taxation is a sham. And he says that local governments are failing at the basic task of accurately assessing property values, and there is a clear and striking pattern. More expensive properties are undervalued, while less expensive properties are overvalued. The result is that wealthy homeowners take a big tax break, while less affluent homeowners are paying a higher price for the same public services. So while in one regard I, I agree that it is, in a way, a wealth tax, because uh, because obviously, uh, even if your even if your McMansion is undervalued, you're still going to be paying more in taxes than than uh, someone like myself who's who's living in a townhouse. But how you know is there actually an inequity there that that isn't realized when people talk about this being a wealth tax? Keep calling and. And that, of course, is uh, you know how are how are these being assessed, uh, and and also how does it affect people that uh, that don't plan on selling? Offer the perspective you were saying um, before the show um, about um, investors, Airbnb, um, and how this impacts them. I thought it was good, and then I'll jump in. Well, so the way I see it is that. Uh, Investors, people flipping houses, uh, people who uh, who rent out houses or uh, or Airbnb them, they're going to be far less concerned by their tax assessment and the and the uh, the tax rate because they can they can always pass that they can always pass that cost along to uh, to their you know, tenants or their guests. Yeah. Whereas, uh, what do you do if you've lived in a house for 20 years and you don't ever plan on selling it? That, uh, that uh, reassessment, that uh, equity may help if you ever want to take out a, you know, a home equity line of credit or, uh, or get a second mortgage or whatever. But if you're not planning on doing that, then you're basically just paying more to live in the same place that you've always lived. Yeah. And you're never going to get... You're never going to see the uh, the return because you're not planning on selling the house. 
this is a tough topic. It's a new, it's a very complicated topic, and we're going to try to unpack it, and we'll try to deliver this at a, uh, you know, very simple um, level. Um, Judah makes some really good points, and we have Anonymous on Twitter offering some perspective as well. Um, Anonymous, through a comment he's made in the past um, tied to the previous homeowner um, at his house, I have a pretty good feel. In fact, I know pretty almost exactly of where he lives, and he lives in a very prestigious um, Tony area. I'll get to his comments in a matter of moments. I'll take it from uh, a standpoint of being a real estate investor myself, and I'll take it um, and I'll listen to learn from, from what the viewers and listeners have because the comments are coming in already fast and furious. Look, if, you, if a jurisdiction raises the meals tax, which they've done in the city, yeah. they raised it, um, I was talking about that with the uh, restaurant owner. I mentioned that yesterday. When they raise the meals tax, that meals tax impacts everybody across the income spe- spectrum. Everyone yeah. is impacted by the meals tax. It's not a, a tax that's necessarily um, the meals tax is a tax that knows no socioeconomic status. Right. The more you want to eat out, the more you pay that tax. Exactly. Now, you can make an argument that if you don't have deep pockets, you're going to eat out less. Yeah. And if you do have deep pockets, you're going to eat out more. So then you can make perhaps the argument that the meals tax does indeed tax the wealthy because folks that have wealth are more likely to go to restaurants to wine and dine as opposed to someone that's on a fixed income in between jobs underemployed or struggling to meet their bills, they're less likely to go to a restaurant in the downtown mall. That's a fair argument that I just made there. I also want to highlight that moms and dads, like my wife and I, we have two young boys. Granted, one little boy is eight weeks old, little almost nine weeks old, wow. And our oldest is almost five years old. And we use the experience of going to restaurants as a way to socialize our boys. Yeah. So when you do raise taxes, um, the meals tax at restaurants, you are limiting the socialization potential for moms and dads when taking their kids out to help them mature, um, you know, interact with adults yeah. and, and figure out life. Um, so that's something to be considered. Now, and that's, and that's especially noticeable in times like these when we're seeing, uh, you know, increased inflation and increased costs of everything from what chicken wings to eggs to, uh, you know, whatever else. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and I also want to highlight this, and this is, this is a straightforward comment. Like if you're a mom and dad and you're trying to socialize your kids at a restaurant, it's one thing to take your children to a pizza parlor or a McDonald's and have them socialize that way. It's another thing altogether to take them to like, say a sit down restaurant. Yeah. Where it's like uh, tablecloth, white tablecloth, um, you know, uh, cloth, uh, cloth napkin, and mm-hmm. and and waiter service, right? Um, because it's a different level of expectation of behavior. I mean, if you're going to a McDonald's and there's a playground yeah. inside, your kids are going to run around. If you're going and you're taking your kids to say like citizen burger bar or hamilton's or the aberdeen barn or zocalo or the local the expectation for behavior is different than the golden arches yeah you don't want them running over to someone else's table and they're gonna have to sit on the chair and behave mcdonald's you're gonna have a little bit of freedom chick-fil-a a little bit more freedom less people judging no doubt so is the tax the increased taxes on rooftops progressive regressive a wealth tax equitable or is it leading to gentrification in this community? Um, I'm of the mindset that all increasing, all tax increases are regressive. Um, I'm of the mindset that a jurisdiction and elected officials should find incremental sources. And what I mean by incremental is new, new sources of tax revenue. So like if you're on city council or, or, and you're on the board of supervisors, you should be considered considering ideas or ways to drive revenue for your jurisdiction that's not tied to rooftops or personal property. Maybe that's business incubation where you're attracting new businesses to the area. And then because you've attracted new businesses to the area, they will start 
offering incremental revenue to the jurisdiction. Now, the tough part of attracting new businesses to the area, if they hire from without the area, or if they bring in their employees that are not tied to Central Virginia, that's another form of gentrification too. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing that happen. We're going to see that happen with the biotech, um, the UVA biotech hub on Fontaine. And we'll certainly see that happen with the data science center on Ivy Road. Mm-hmm. This will create additional, um, this will yield people coming to this area, new people not tied to the central Virginia area, and cannibalizing real estate. They're going to need a place to live. And when they cannibalize the real estate, that's going to displace a local. Yeah. Or that'll create a local having to drive a little bit further because they can't afford the rooftops that are close to the um, epicenter of employment. Um, and if these people are coming into uh, into Charlottesville with uh, with a lot of money, because uh, as we've seen in the past, you know somebody coming from New York has a lot more money to spend on square footage than they than they would where they came from. Then uh, you know we start to see prices of property rise again. Yeah, and, and Matt um, Daring, I got that right today, Matt, um, back-to-back days he's commenting, Matt, we don't always see eye-to-eye, but one thing I can um, agree on with you is is I know you care tremendously about Charlottesville and Central Virginia, and you are very well informed and very well read, sir. And while our ideologies may differ, I do respect the fact that you are so informed with what's going on. Matt, I'm going to relay your comments on air. And Matt, I'm going to relay the comments from Anonymous on Twitter via direct message. The comments are very different. I would love, and I don't know how you feel about this, Anonymous. You know, just put this on your radar. I think a great show would be Matt Daring and Anonymous, the I Love Seville versions um, of Deep Throat um, on set, kind of bantering back and forth. That would be fantastic content. And people very much would, would, would love what these two guys have to say. Yeah. Um, I'll get to Matt's comment and I'll get to Deep Throat's comment here in a matter of moments. Look, I can't think of I can't think of a more equitable way to fund a jurisdiction outside of attracting new businesses to the area, outside of finding new sources of revenue. I can't find a more I can't think of a more equitable way for funding a jurisdiction than than real estate assessments and the taxes that come from it. If you have a bigger house, larger square feet, and more land, you pay more to the jurisdiction. If you have a smaller house, less square feet, and little to no land, you pay less to the jurisdiction. I understand that every year that taxes go up on a house is going to impact potentially the lower end of the finance spectrum more than the higher end of the finance spectrum because the lower end of the finance spectrum may be living paycheck to paycheck and has less savings, where the higher end of the finance spectrum has deeper pockets, more savings, and has the sophistication potentially of finding different sources of income, right? If you're working 60 hours a week and you're clocking in and you're clocking out, it's going to be hard for you to develop a side hustle it's going to be hard for you to figure out the, the, um, the education to you know, do some of the stuff that I'm doing where you're you know, trading stocks and equities, you're finding additional sources of revenue from that, you're, you're, you're buying condominiums or, or office space um, yeah. to help supplement mm-hmm. over additional overhead, right? right? Um, but I empathize with folks on a fixed budget. Um, and why I empathize with folks that are on a fixed budget is because I've seen it with my parents mm-hmm. and I also saw it with my grandparents. I often tell the story on this talk show that I was FaceTiming my mom. She likes to see the boys. And one time on FaceTime, my mom, who colors her hair black, she got on FaceTime and her hair was completely gray. Mm-hmm. And I said, Mom, your, your hair, why is it not black anymore? Why is it gray? She said, your dad and I are retired and we're on a fixed income and coloring my hair cost us, you know, a hundred, bu- almost a hundred dollars. So we chose to use that a hundred dollars from covering, coloring my hair and utilize it for groceries yeah. or utilize it for fixed overhead. 
Yeah, my and, parents went through a similar uh, situation during uh, during COVID, where they were looking at their looking at their uh, uh, their bills and trying to figure out what they could do to cut costs. And my mom ended up getting a selling her car and getting a smaller one. And uh, you know, that's just one of the things that they did because you know sometimes you've got to make cuts somewhere, especially when uh, they're retired. Yeah, they're retired. Your parents are retired. My parents are retired. They're on a fixed income. Yeah. Uh, my mom's parents, Mima and Poppy, I mean, eventually they sold their house because it became too much financially from an overhead standpoint. And then they ended up moving in with mom and dad, my parents. Yeah. Um, and that's how they managed mm -hmm. the costly nature of owning a crib, a house. Yeah. So how do we solve this? And I'll get to comments. Bill McChesney, I'll get to your comments. Matt, I'll get to your comments. Lisa, I'll get to your comments. Grayson, I'll get to your comments. Jonathan, I'll get to your comments. Deep Throat, I'm going to get to your comments here in a matter of moments. Um, Lisa, I'll get to your comments. A lot of comments coming in. This topic is really resonating now because I think people are really realizing how much they're going to be paying in the very near future. Um, yeah, and, and I truly believe you're going to be paying even more once the city of Charlottesville and Almore County raise the real estate tax rate as well. So how right. do you solve this? How do you keep massive gentrification from happening? We already have gentr gentrificational uh, momentum on the horizon. The data science school, Willow Tree is saying it's hiring more people, including in Willow Tree is bringing people in from outside the area. The biotech hub on Fontaine Avenue. The University of Virginia has already said there's going to be thousands of people in the very near future coming to Central Virginia tied to the biotech hub and six-figure jobs. We're talking PhDs, heavy hitters, and not necessarily from this area. And they're going to cannibalize real estate. They're going to buy real yeah. estate and houses. And they're going to push folks that are on the middle class and, do we and even, lower out. Do we even have a middle class anymore? I mean, I think the middle class has been pinched so much that it's... Um, essentially eroding. And one of the things that should concern us the most, not just as Charlottesvillians or Almore Countyans or Central Virginians or Virginians, but as Americans, the fact that the middle class is being pitched, pinched and essentially eroded away, that should really worry you. Because uh, an economy is as strong as its middle class. And when the middle class starts getting pinched, then your economy starts becoming one of wealthy and not one of um, equity. Yeah, and I'm, can we even, I mean, can we even still classify the middle class as middle class? I mean, what do you mean? Well, I'm looking, at, uh, I'm looking at what is middle class income, and it says here, uh, using Pew's yardstick, middle income is made up of people who make between 43000 something and 130000 Okay. Well, when you get to the point where people who are at the top of that, middle class yardstick can't afford you know can't afford home ownership in in your city do you still consider that middle class when it gets impossible for the middle class to afford uh, you know to even buy a home do they do you classify them lower then or or does the term middle class even have any meaning anymore I mean, what's the area median income in Charlottesville and Almaro County? I mean, I don't know the exact figure, but for a family of four, I think it's in the vicinity of $115,000, $130,000 um, for Almaro County and the city of Charlottesville. Um, so how do you fix it? I mean, is, it, is, it, is, is the way to solve this and to manage and to keep gentrification from happening, expanding the tax relief program? And then I'm going to also offer this. If the tax relief program is expanded and you're a homeowner and you're, say, like Bill McChesney is watching this program, Bill has openly admitted on this program in the comment section that he and his wife are retired. They live in the city of Charlottesville. He's the mayor of McIntyre. They're on a fixed income. Yeah. They lived in the house for a long period of time and they have significant equity in their house. Yeah. So if the real estate tax relief program is associated with, with, with your um, net worth and you've been in a house for almost the full 30 years, if not longer, of your mortgage, then you have an asset. You have an asset, especially in this city, that's probably flirting with half a million dollars. 
and then you're probably not going to qualify for the real estate tax relief program. Right. Another thing you could potentially do is to go to Charlottesville City or to go to Almaro County and appeal your assessment, do an assessment appeal, uh, but be very careful if you do a real estate assessment appeal. Because it could, it could come out higher. I have colleagues and friends that have done real estate assessment appeals. And when they've done these real estate assessment appeals, the assessor comes and takes a look at, at their house. And the numbers actually come in higher. I'll take it a step further. One of my buddies did a remodel on his house. Yeah. And the remodel in the house was a little hush, hush, hush remodel. And they didn't go through the building permit process. Oh, and when man. they did the remodel in the house and the assessor came to look at his crib, wife, three kids, pretty big house. I mean, we're talking about 5,000 square feet. And the assessor looked at the house and said, dude, you got a, a completely new kitchen and you finished your basement. When we did the assessment on your house... We didn't do it on a brand new kitchen that is clearly over a hundred grand or a basement that was finished for an in-law suite. And where is your building permits for all this construction work? Uh oh. And that created a Pandora's box of significant headache for this family that was it. way more complicated, way more adversarial, and way more costly than just paying the assessment that they appealed in the first place. Right. So they regretted appealing the assessment because they ended up costing them more money and then they had to do with the fiasco of not getting building permits for the remodeling they did. Right. So that was a, it was a hot mess for them. I'm talking months of mess and they paid more in taxes because the, the assessor said, actually, your assessment's wrong. It should be higher. So be very careful with that. Yeah. Be very, very careful with that, especially if you're seeing... Um, if you're seeing um, uh, your neighbors um, doing a lot of uh, improvements to your house, because that's a comp. Yeah. That's a comp that they're going to base your assessment on. So how do you fix this? How do we fix it? What do we do? What do you do if you're Lloyd Snook? What do you do if you're Nag Galloway? What do you do if you're, you're Donna Price or, or Michael Payne or Brian Pinkston or uh, Jim Andrews, or Diantha McKeel. How do you fix this, and is it truly progressive, regressive, or a wealth tax? Any thoughts you want to offer, and then I'll take a deep dive here, because I, th I have a feeling I may talk a little longer on this one. I mean, I, I don't know as much as I would like to. I, I would think uh, if there were a way to... Uh, if there were a way to what's the word I'm looking for, uh, <clears throat> put off some of, the, uh, some of the taxes. I mean, I know that this all goes towards, you know, it goes towards schools and like we've talked about. Uh, but um, I don't know if there was some way to, uh, um, to, to pay less while you're, you know, if, if you're living in a house for, for 20 years, you're not paying the full, uh, you know, the full cost of that, and maybe there's a way to uh, to recoup that for the city when when a home is sold. Keep going. I mean, I, it's just a. Uh, I'm just shooting from the hip. I like it. I like it. That's what we're going to do today. Shoot from the hip here. Um, and I, re I I appreciate what you're saying here, and then guys, we'll get to your comments. I mean, obviously, when uh, when a home is sold, that's when that's when money changes hands. I, I feel like that would be one of the easiest and less least um, least harmful. Not harmful is not the word I'm looking for. The least uh, the least causing of hardship. Uh, you know, you're. You can take that into uh, into account the same way you do for fees like uh, like uh, an inspection and uh, and paying the uh, um, you know the uh, the guy who checks the deed and and all that stuff that always comes with uh, with buying or selling a home. If you just bake that in, it might be a way to alleviate some of that you know some of the pain that you feel um, when the tax bill comes due every you know every six months. Respect that. Um, here's my take. I think the first 
priority if you're an elected official is to find incremental sources of revenue, but they have to be caveated, the incremental sources of revenue, to prioritize hiring within Central Virginia. Hmm. If Albemarle County or the city of Charlottesville, government, I'm talking specifically government here, choose to bring new business here to help alleviate the burden of rooftop taxes, they have to figure out a way to caveat the new business coming here, hiring within the community. Yeah. Because if the new business that comes in here brings outside employees or hires from outside Central Virginia, that's going to expedite gentrification quicker or at a faster clip than increasing taxes on rooftops. Okay. Yeah. So if you're an elected official... And I think you're also saying that if, uh, if people in our area are hired to those positions, most likely they'll be getting raises, which will help them to you know, actively cover the costs of those, uh, those rising, rising assessments and, and tax rates. That's my point. Like, I really respect it. Now, Willow Tree has acknowledged they're going to hire outside the area and move them to Charlottesville to the Woolen Mills headquarters. But Willow Tree has also formed a partnership with Piedmont, uh, with, with the community college, with Piedmont, yeah. where if you go on this two-year track at Piedmont, Willow Tree is going to try to cherry-pick the talent that comes out of this two-year program and then hire them. Yeah. So while they're hiring folks from outside the area, they're also creating a funnel of human talent mm -hmm. through Piedmont to their technology firm. And I love that move. Um, Matt um, Daring's got some good comments, then I'll get to Anonymous, and then I'll get to um, Mark McKinney. Mark McKinney's watching the uh, program. He's on the Crozet Community Advisory Committee, and I, I really respect what Mark says. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see Mark McKinney make a push, maybe not in the near future, perhaps in the near future, for a Board of Supervisor spot. I think Mark would make a great Board of Supervisor. Mark, are you in the Whitehall District? If you could let me know, that would be great. Mark McKinney of the Crozet Community Advisory Committee says, AMI, Area Median Income for the Charlottesville MSA, I said it was, what, 115000 to 125000 He says in 2022, he looked it up, it's 111200 for area median income in the Charlottesville MSA. He also said a family of four who makes 52400 in the Charlottesville MSA is considered very low income. Family of four, 52400 and the Charlottesville MSA is considered very, very low income. Okay? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at something that says that the uh, median income in Charlottesville for individual is <clears throat> just over 31000 for household is uh, about fifty nine six. What What source are you citing there? Uh, let's see. Uh, sources, United States Census Bureau. Okay. I, I, I'm... The, the area median income... That for, was 2020. Okay, the area median income for the Charlottesville MSA is... I said it was about 115 to 125. It's in that vicinity. Mark, Mark's got a 111,000 from 2022, and that number's gotten higher. It's gotten more. It's gotten uh, more. Um, yeah, and, and Anonymous makes, makes a really good point. The Charlottesville income stats from the census are very, very wrong because of um, student households. Okay. Yeah. I because it's uh, it's considering UVA student households. I wasn't claiming they had a better you know better and, numbers than you guys. And he also said anonymous as saying the one hundred eleven thousand is for families, so it excludes singletons and students. Yeah, that's that's the number, the one hundred eleven thousand and change, um, because it does not count the UVA students. Gotcha. And and, and individual people. Um, my fear. And I've been very consistent with this fear. Is I'm seeing Charlottesville. I'll start with the positive. We have such a. Why do we live here? We live here all basically for the similar reasons. We I live either, here because my parents are here, and okay. I love being near them. Oh, you you are a great son. <laughs> Your parents are lucky to have you as a son. And I'm lucky to have them. Yeah. Um, I, I, you're a very good human. Thank you. Um, all parents should be fortunate to have a son like you. Okay. A lot of people would not choose to live in an area to be close to their parents. 
right? I, One of the, sure. pri the primary <laughs> reason you're saying you live here. My it, sisters are about as far on the from west here coast. as you can get. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Uh, I would imagine your sisters have, have a very different temperament than you do. They do. They, they love my parents as well. But uh, Can they, they hang out with your parents as long as you can? Probably not. That's why vacation is a wonderful thing, because it's a short <laughs> period of time, and then you guys go your separate ways. Yeah. Or with you, you genuinely enjoy their company. Yeah. Um, like I said, all parents should be so fortunate to have a, a, a son, as Vanessa Parkhill just said, you're a thoughtful son, Judah. And Vanessa Parkhill also has a very thoughtful son herself, um, one I know firsthand. Um, most people don't choose to live in an area um, because they, are, they want to be near their parents. A lot of people don't. They choose to live in Charlottesville or Central Virginia because we got restaurants or we got ACC Sports or we got Corn Capshaw's music scene, or we yeah. got hiking and outdoors, or we got um, jobs and opportunity, mm -hmm. or we have an affinity or a relationship with the University of Virginia, yeah. where we spent four years and they were the four best years of our lives, and that keeps us here. Or you launch a business, or mm -hmm. businesses. Um, we all have similar reasons for why we live here. The quality of life is amazing in Central Virginia. It's absolutely amazing. And what's happening is the secret's gotten out. The secret's gotten out because of the national and global media coverage of the best place to live. The secret's, secret's gotten out because the University of Virginia is expanding its enrollment. More students are coming. And as more students come, they get a taste of Charlottesville over four years of undergraduate or a taste of Charlottesville in graduate school. And they're like, God, this place is amazing. Yesterday, I was playing uh, squash in the evening, uh, mm -hmm. post-work. And I was uh, playing with two um, Darden students. I enjoy playing against the Darden students because they're extremely young and they're very talented. So when I play them and then I play the guys that are, live in the area, I'm like, well, I can, I can hang with these guys after playing with these Darden students because they're talented. And these guys aren't as talented. So it's great practice. But these guys are, are getting an MBA from Darden. And they're coming out of Darden with MBAs with jobs lined up at $225,000, $250,000. Now, what they're slowly realizing is $225,000 or $250,000 in San Francisco. is not the same as And in Manhattan is not the same as, I don't know what number you want to call for Charlottesville. Yeah. The guy that's taking a job, he played squash at Bowden, 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 I think it's I think Bowden. It's Bowden. Bowden. Thank Is you, it's Bowden. Maine? He played he played Bowden. what's that? I think it's Bowden too. I think it's Bowden. Let's yeah. not get in the weeds on that. Let's yeah, not get in the weeds. I'm not. Yeah. He played at Bowden, then he got an MBA. Uh, he's getting his MBA at Darden. He uh, is taking a, a job in San Francisco, and this job at San Francisco, he's flirting with 200k salary. And while going to San Francisco and flirting with 200K at salary, he's got two roommates. Yeah. He's gone and got two roommates. Um, yeah, and he's probably having a hard time saving money. He basically said he's going to struggle to save money in San Francisco at 200K. He's got multiple roommates, and he's going to be working 90 to 100 hours a week. And he's going to be doing that, he says, for um, two, two and a half years. He's an associate. And then his climb after associate, I don't know the next rung up, but he said he doesn't truly start making money until he gets to the managing director level. And I said, how long is that going to take? He goes, I'm probably going to have to clock somewhere between 80 and 100 hours a week for the next five to six years before and, I get to managing director. And, and let's, also, after that. let's also put in perspective that he's coming out um, nearly $300,000 in debt at a 7% interest rate. Yeah. So his interest rate is 7%, and he's got $300,000 in debt. He's got flirting with $200,000 yearly salary, and he's got no quality of life. Yeah. I mean, he's got roommates, no quality of life, and 90 to 100 hour workload for five to six years before he starts getting some breathing room. Sounds um, miserable to me. It, 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 it does not sound super appealing to me either. And he indicated to me, he goes, Jerry, I said, maybe you've done it the right way, um, finding an area that's got an incredible quality of life that has perhaps more affordability than Manhattan or Chicago or San Francisco yeah. or Austin, Texas or Atlanta or D.C. or Georgetown, these hubs of, of, right. of MBAs where they go. Yeah. Um, he goes, look at what you're, you can do. 
Now, I, want, I, I immediately highlighted to him, um, I'm able to do this because, frankly speaking, for me, for 10, 11 years, I worked, like, and you saw it, um, 80, 90 hours a week. You basically did what he's doing. I did what he's doing. I did what he did, yeah. Um, the difference is um, the affordability here versus the affordability there allowed me to save some money and save that money to put into real estate, and that's really been a momentum. Yeah. Um, so how do we fix it? What do we do, and where do we go from here? I mean, and, and Anonymous makes a good point. This is a great Woody Fitchum topic. Um, I think the elected officials are going to have to use, and I'm going to steal a phrase from Keith Smith, there's no silver bullet solution. It's a yeah. silver buckshot solution. And the silver buckshot solution is going to be expanded real estate um, tax relief programs. Mm -hmm. And those real estate tax relief programs that are expanded need to be branded and marketed at a much considerable clip that they're doing now. I think a lot of people don't even know about them. I think the jurisdictions also need to do a much better job of attracting um, employers to the area and insisting that the employers that are attracted to the area hire from within the community, similar to that willow tree pipeline with Piedmont. Yeah. I also think the elected officials in this area need to prioritize um, the University of Virginia and, 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 and get more revenue from UVA. Definitely. You know, no one, Michael Payne tried to do this, mm -hmm. the, the payment in lieu of taxes program, yeah. or he started floating this into the news cycle, and Jim Ryan and the University of Virginia immediately shot it down. I'd be curious to see this, if this happened. If the Almore County Board of Supervisors worked in um, conjunction with the Charlottesville City Council, mm. and then you had Charlottesville City Council and the Board of Supervisors working on the same front and the same push to get yeah. more money from UVA. Because when the University of Virginia, the largest landowner in the city of Charlottesville and Almora County, when they purchase properties... They and essentially they, take it off the rolls and all of us have to pay more in, yeah. uh, in, uh, you know, because of that. Right. UVA is the largest landowner <coughs> in the city of Almora County. As they buy more, it puts more pressure on us. Yeah. Now, UVA will say, not so fast, the economic vitality in Charlottesville and Almar County, we're the largest driver of that vitality. So we're bringing in more money for meals taxes. We're and... hiring people. We're paying them well. We're creating a biotech firm. We're creating a data science school. We're, ho we're doing a hotel conference center. We're doing a lot of these additional things that are driving economic vitality. And that economic vitality is what's keeping your jurisdiction afloat. Yeah. We got football, we got basketball, we got all these sports, we got all these students coming to us, we're expanding enrollment, we're driving jurisdictional economic vitality. So the fact mm -hmm. that you're saying you need to go after our, our taxes on our real estate is, is, is not fair to us. Okay? So they make a decent point, the University of Virginia. Okay? But I'd be curious to see what would happen if, if someone who was elected to the Board of Supervisors, and I'm just talking out loud, if someone who was elected to the Board of Supervisors, maybe it's an enterprising man or woman with a small business mindset that happens to know all the city councilors and happens to know all the Board of Supervisors, is on a first-name basis with all of them and can galvanize all of them in one room and say, hey, Board of Supervisors, hey, city councilors, why don't we pool our resources and our efforts and let's put a, a, a slide deck together, a pitch deck, an Excel spreadsheet, whatever the hell you want to call it, however you want to present it, and say, UVA, as you're buying real estate, this is what it's doing to the citizens. And then they could utilize a platform like this, the Board of Supervisors and the City Council, to push this, um, this plan out to the community and say, this is how we're going to relieve your tax burden, mm -hmm. is we're going to get more revenue from the University of Virginia. I think that is a legitimate legitimate plan of attack that's very solid. I'm sure University of Virginia would offer some pushback, but there are examples of schools throughout the community that have schools throughout the country, excuse me, that have done this. Look at what Harvard University is doing in the Boston area, the Cambridge area, with its payment in lieu of taxes program. Very, mm -hmm. very real, very tangible, and very impactful. That's what's happening over there. Um, Here's something that... Uh, uh, resonates with me and uh and again like i said i i know very little about this but uh 
Uh, this sounds a little kind of like what I was talking about. Uh, uh, California at one point uh, passed Proposition 13 that locked uh, locked uh, assessments to 1975 market value levels or the most recent purchase price and restricted increases on assessments to no more than 2% each year. Then um, another proposed uh, tax ballot, Proposition 15, created the split roll tax system in which residential property and commercial property would be assessed and taxed under different regimes. Commercial property would be assessed to market price every three years while residential property continued under the under Proposition 13. Um, and then, like I said, if you could, uh, if you could recoup some of the, uh, some of that, let's say, deferred taxation to when somebody sells a house, uh, then it's much, much easier to pull that out of the, uh, the transaction than it is to get it from someone who's, like, you know, we've talked about living on a, a fixed income and maybe isn't ever planning on selling a home. But it's still going to burn people's bridges if at the time of sale they have a t huge tax bill from deferred taxes. People are going to get pissed off about that. That's fair. But I, it's, I don't think, based on this, it doesn't look like, you know, it's not like you're paying uh, a pittance. It's not like you're paying half or a quarter of what, what everyone else is. It's more like you're just not seeing these big spikes of like a 13% rise in your assessment and then getting hit with a, with a, a, a raise in taxes, you know, property taxes on top of that. It's an idea. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of... Um, Anonymous put this on my radar. Um, become an Austin. I'm fearful of becoming um, Greenwich hmm. or San Francisco. Yeah. Or um, my father-in-law and mother-in-law live on Long Island and they come to visit us all the time. My wife and I have been uh, married um, or have been together almost eight years. And over those eight years, they visit a lot. They're very close, my wife and, and my, my parents-in-law. So they visit mm -hmm. and they stay extended periods of time. Yeah. My father-in-law said the last time in the eight years that he's been coming to Charlottesville that this community looks completely different to him. He said, when I was coming here eight years ago, it was not as developed. It didn't have this traffic congestion. He's seeing more New Yorkers and Yankees here than ever before because he talks to everybody. Um, and they talk to him. He's basically saying in these eight years, it looks like a completely different community to him. Hmm. Um, we also have seen the um, collateral damage of the pandemic. The yeah. pandemic has yeah. got folks working from internet service providers, ISPs in their basement, and commanding salaries from outside the area. Yeah. Um, I talk about that with my neighbors all the time. Um, the folks that live near us, um, they sold a townhome in Georgetown for a million plus, um, bought a 5,000 square foot house for 800, yeah. dumped a quarter million into it, and still had, what, a quarter million left over, a few hundred thousand dollars left over, and they both work at, at the house for for firms in, in, in Northern Virginia and the D.C. area. Yeah. Um, got kids in private schools, do whatever they want, um, and that's, that's becoming much more common now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also have what Cree Deeds is pushing through. Cree Deeds is trying to allow the um, Virginia jurisdictions to um, um, raise um, taxes to benefit school districts. The General Assembly is proposing a bill that would let localities hold a referendum to allow people to, to decide if they want to raise sales taxes by 1%. Um, mm -hmm. And if this is approved by citizens in Charlottesville and Almaro County, then you could potentially get 14 to $15 million for school improvement for Charlottesville City and $23 million for Almar County. Here's the concern I have. By the time these school projects are finished, the folks that these would benefit truly are going to be pushed out of this community because they won't be able to afford to live here. Right. I mean, we talk constantly about Burley school re reconfiguration on this show. 
the Burley School reconfiguration project is the number 50 million now? Is it 60 million now? Is it 70 million now? Is it yep. closer to 100 million now because of inflation, because of material costs, because of labor, because of interest rates? No one truly knows the exact number. And its completion the, is 10 years out. The completion is years away. Yeah. Years away. If the completion is so far away, are the folks that we're truly trying to do reconfiguration for even going to be able to afford to still live here? Right. Or will they have been gentrified out of the community to, say, Buckingham, Fluvanna, or the other side of the mountain? Yeah. I mean, why aren't we having that conversation? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we unpacking it and taking a deeper dive on that? Right. Let's get to comments coming in. Um, I want to go to Anonymous. Dude's smart guy. You have an open invitation, um, Deep Throat, to come on this program anytime you want. And we can do it in any capacity you want, Anonymous. It could be you and I. I think um, you would uh, find Matt Daring refreshing, and you guys are quite opposite in ideology, um, Anonymous, you and Matt. And I think spending an hour, the three of us on this show, would be absolutely um, entertaining, enlightening, and educational for the viewers and listeners. But he's got some comments that are coming in here. And then I'll get to Mark McKinney of the Crozet Community Advisory Committee. I'll get to Matt's comments. I'll get to Lisa's. We have two Board of Supervisors that are watching the program right now and one city councilor um, watching our program right now. All right. So Anonymous says this, and he sent a number of uh, comments here. Property tax is not as regressive as sales tax, but generally the wealthy, while they have more expensive homes, spend a lower, lower portion of income on housing than lower income people. So call it slightly regressive, he says. Of course, people who live in public housing or otherwise exempt housing do not get dinged at all, so maybe at the lower end it is progressive. He also says, um, in terms of vertical progressivity, what Judah Wickhauer is talking about, he says, I have run the numbers for Seville. Price-related bias for Charlottesville actually tilts progressive. Hmm. Minus 0 0.07 for 2022, where zero is totally fair. And um, greater than zero is regressive. Price-related bias is the metric of choice in the International Association of Assessment Officers. Um, he says the Seville city has said it will get, what's that? That's good to know. Yeah. You want to add anything to that? No, no, no. I, I just, I'm appreciating the, uh, the insight. Okay. Um, he says, any business can say it is driving economic vitality. They pay taxes though. He's also offered a number of comments. This is a, a complicated topic to do via, via comments on direct message. Um, Vanessa, I'll get to yours here in a matter of moments. I want to get to Matt's here. God, there are a lot of comments coming in. I, I see why there are a lot of comments coming in, Judah, because this is all happening right now. Yeah. Um, and people are starting to freak out. Um, let's see. Let's go to Mark McKinney. Sorry, the uh, pages are moving a little uh, slow over here. I'll get to, uh, in fact, let me close up my browser and go. Let me All know right. if there's anything you want me to look up. What's that? Let me know if there's anything you want me to look up. Okay, I will. Thank you. All right, here's Vanessa's stuff. Uh, Vanessa Parkhill is the queen of Earliesville. How is it fixed? What do city council and board of supervisors do? Take a real close look at their spending. Stop playing Santa Claus with the tax revenue. Stop creating new expenditures when they are gifted with surplus funds. Sometimes we have to tighten our belts at home. Our elected officials should consider doing the same. Tax revenue should not be considered an endless pot of money from taxpayers. Um, she also says, so if the government is managing these tax relief plans, is the community really getting the most bang for its buck? This approach results in bureaucrats taking their cut off the top and funneling the money where they want it to go, which often leaves many on the margin out of the relief loop altogether. I'd rather leave more money in citizens' pockets and allow those who choose to contribute to relief efforts to direct the funds to the organizations of their choosing, like the land trust that Keith Smith supports. Maybe the more the government gets involved results in much of the angst felt throughout our country 
because roughly half the population feels they are not happy with what the government is doing. That's a good comment. Yeah. Mark McKinney, Crozet Community Advisory Committee, says, Jerry Miller, the counter argument to UVA and the property tax is why, as a state school, are families still having to spend thousands in tuition to attend UVA? Yes, there is an economic benefit to UVA, but we pick up that expense in so many other ways. Decent comment from Mark right there. Yeah. Mark, I really like when you watch the show. Um, I think you make the program better, sir. Um, Lisa Costello, meals tax also applies to the struggling single parent working two jobs. Who can't afford to cook at home. Yeah, that is going, yeah, you saw that? That have no, no, to no, go through I, the drive through because they are exhausted after work. Yeah, I, they know still, she, I know what she's talking about. I'm sorry, go on. They still pay meals tax at McDonald's as they do at the Aberdeen Barn. My dad purchased the two-bed, one-bath house I live in today in 1964 for 12500 with monthly payments of 120 Yes, those amounts were more um, than they are now. My new next-door neighbor renting the one-bedroom, one-bath house is paying $2,200 per month. I told if um, <laughs> I told him um, to pitch a tent and rent a porter potty, and he can move into my house into the backyard. He started laughing. I kept my face straight. I was not joking. <laughs> Raising the taxes on the house next door, the owner will pass it on to my renting neighbor. The last neighbor couldn't afford to the increases and left. They have no problem finding wealthy folks to rent here. I mean. That's good. I, I found this astonishing. The, uh, the, uh, the Lark or the Landmark, whatever that big tower is where um, Hardywood was or where uh, mm. slipping, Skipping Rock used to be on West Main where Devil's Backbone is going to open a satellite tap room. Yeah. That big tower of apartments is now up to $17.50 per room. $1,750 per room, and you have roommates. You have a common space. It's not private or a studio. It's $1,750 per room, and it's a rent increase every single year. Yeah. Um, I would be very, for the Board of Supervisors that are watching here, and you know I respect your anonymity, um, and the city councilors that are watching the program, I would very much encourage you guys to... to keep the tax rate either the same on real estate or see if you can figure out a way to lower it. And the reason I encourage you to do that is, 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 is folks are really hurting right now. Um, we're hurting all for the same reasons, whether it's gas or groceries, um, whether it's clothing, um, whether it's just the necessities we need to survive. Yeah. They're just way more costly now. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the cost of a car. Yeah. Look at, look at what adjustable rates, look at what Jerome Powell is doing by raising uh, rates. Credit cards are, are, depending on your credit score, some folks have APRs that are 23% plus. Where they initially started accruing that debt, the APRs were 15, 16%. Mm -hmm. a, a, eight, a 7 to 8% delta in APR is, is, is massive. Yeah, it's, and it's that's, massive for people, and the effect is outsized for uh, for small businesses as well because they're less easily able to absorb the uh, the extra cost of uh, of servicing the credit. I mean, I'll, I'll put it in perspective here. A lot of people think our, our the primary thing we do here is the I Love Seville Network and these talk shows. This is this is. It's not a top five income stream here. It's fun. We understand the responsibility. I never anticipated it morphing into what it has. It drives revenue, strong revenue, really good revenue. It keeps extreme visibility for the companies, which attracts business to the other companies we're running out of here. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, what this firm does is we're an advertising agency and a real estate holding company. That's what we do. Those are our top two streams. 24 tenants in the portfolio, 106, 107 clients in the marketing agency. That's how we make our living, okay? And if I told our clients, look, I need to raise you guys 15% year over year on the retainers we're charging you, our clients would say, dude, 
we can't afford that, or dude, that's insulting. We're not going to do that. Or they'd be like, peace, see you later, we're going to somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, there are some years where I don't even raise our clients. Legitimately, there are some years where I don't even raise our clients with the retainer. Yeah. And what I then have to do is, because my, you get raise every year, right? Yep. What I then have to do is go hustle more business to make up the delta of additional overhead. Mm-hmm. And we do that. And we've been doing that over 15 years. We've been fortunate. Um, but a small business isn't going to be able to pass the overhead to the uh, customer. The customer yeah. is going to be the additional overhead. The customer is going to revolt right. and take their business elsewhere. Mm-hmm. unfortunately not all small businesses can just say I'm going to hustle new, new business I'm going right. to find new clients right yeah not everyone has that skill and we saw what uh, what was that picture that we showed it was was it chicken I was I mean chicken chicken wings it was french fries yeah. Angelique Hawkins with the french fries yeah, yeah. she was talking about uh, 40 45 percent increase on french fries the price. yeah I mean it's 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 everything you know yeah um, and you can't just ask customers to pay twice as much for a piece of chicken or for French fries. Albert Graves on Twitter. Albert, you've really, he's Warrior AG. You've really been making the program better. Um, he said he has a $386 increase on taxes twice a year this year. So his taxes have essentially gone up 800 bucks. Man. So 400 in June, 400 in December. Yeah. He says... The jurisdiction also needs to learn blue-collar workers are needed along with housing for the blue-collar workers. No doubt. You, you champion that all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, what happens when, uh, when all the people that work? I mean, you like McDonald's? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, people have to work there. And uh, we all know that we're not going to be raising the, the price. We're not going to be raising minimum wage to make it so that people working at McDonald's can afford to work there full time and own a house. So when it gets too expensive to even rent here, what happens to all the McDonald's workers? What happens, what happens to Charlottesville from a quality of life standpoint if it's just an area of wealth but no one to work the service businesses? Yeah. Where does the wealthy get coffee? Right. Where do they get their dry cleaning done? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Where do they get, who, wait, who, who waits on them at the restaurants? Or what live music do they hear st- play? Or are there even still restaurants around? What's the live music that's heard? Right? Yeah. All the stuff that we, we love the breweries. What if there's no one there to brew the beer? Yeah, musicians. Mus- musicians aren't out there for the most part making, you know, they're not living rock star, rock star lives and making millions of dollars. What happens when uh, busking and uh, whatever else they're doing to make ends meet just doesn't, just doesn't uh, do it anymore? What happens when we run out our, our artists and musicians and the rest of the, uh, you know, the rest of the low income wait staff uh, McDonald's workers, people at uh, you know, people working a, a register somewhere. Oh. Philip Dow in Scottsville. Seville's raising taxes to push out the elderly and less fortunate. That's what he just said. Is he implying they're doing it on purpose to push out the well, the elderly and less? I don't think they're doing it on purpose. I just don't think that some folks are seeing the forest through the trees. Right. They don't. I, I, I they think, don't um, I think um, some of them do. Some of them know. Like, I, my politics are completely different from Michael Payne's. Like, Michael, Payne's, Michael Payne is a socialist. But Michael Payne has a pretty damn good feel on what's happening here. Yeah, he's, he's an intelligent... Uh, an intelligent person who I personally have loved having on our show because uh, he never comes on here, you know, spouting some, uh, uh, you know, some 
something that he heard somewhere else, uh, I can always tell that uh, that his opinions are well thought out, and and I appreciate uh, I appreciate what he has to say. Carly Wagner um, says, "I always say Charlottesville has more education than common sense." That's fair. Um, I would rather hire um, a man or woman of common sense than a man or woman of book smarts. I'll take street, uh, street smarts and common sense over book smarts any day of the week. Any day of the week. If we're not careful, we'll see what's happened in pockets of Charlottesville, like Belmont and North Downtown, and it's going to spread everywhere. Yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, I've said this once, I'll say it again, Charlottesville's um, Fifeville neighborhood in less than 10 years is going to look completely different. Yeah, I believe it. Like, where else, if you were trying to buy an affordable house in Charlottesville City, where are you going to buy one? You got the Fifeville neighborhood, you got maybe the Star Hill neighborhood. 10th and Page, you've missed the boat on 10th and Page. Yeah, no doubt. Dairy markets forever change 10th and Page. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to buy one? Fewer and fewer and farther between. So let's conclude. In conclusions, let's sum summarize our strategies of success. Mm -hmm. Real estate tax relief program is one of the silver buckshot. The program should be marketed and branded much more significantly than it's happening now. I think few people know about the real estate tax relief program. Yeah. So expand it and make sure it's much more ubiquitous and far and wide. Yeah. That's one of the silver buckshots. Make sure that people know about it and especially the people that really, really, really do need that uh, relief. Silver buck buckshot number two. Here's the second silver buckshot. You could potentially appeal your assessment. But... If you appeal your assessment, make sure you've done your homework because your assess the assessor could come to your house and actually raise your assessment. And if you do choose to appeal your assessment, make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row when it comes to remodeling projects in your house. Did you get building permits? Does the assessor actually know you remodeled your kitchen or you finished your basement? Yeah. Because if the assessor does not know that and the building permits aren't in play, you could be royally screwed. And I've seen it firsthand with the friend's family. Silver buckshot number three. Elected officials try to pursue incremental or new sources of tax revenue tied to economic development. Mm -hmm. But caveat that economic development with hiring within the community. Right. If you're going to attract new businesses to the area, make sure these businesses are hiring locally as opposed to bringing in human capital from outside Central Virginia, which will then cannibalize real estate and expedite gentrification. Yeah. Silver buckshot number four, consider a collective effort between the Board of Supervisors and City Council when negotiating with the University of Virginia. It's one thing for Michael Payne to propose this by himself on social media mm -hmm. and try to carry the flag of right. a payment in lieu of taxes program or trying to get more money from the University of Virginia on their real estate holdings. It's another thing altogether if six board of supervisors and five city council members, 11 people did it in together concert. in unison, in yeah. concert. That speaks volumes. Yeah. Silver box, buckshot number five. If you're going to do the bargaining or negotiation with the University of Virginia, the largest landowner and, and building owner in the city and the county, make sure it's extremely visible from a public standpoint because there's few more impactful, few more impactful influences than the public. Yeah. If the public gets behind something, power in numbers mm -hmm. trumps wealth. No doubt. There's two kinds of power. There's the power that comes with money, and there's the power that comes from having the populace in your corner. Vox Populi. The populace in your corner always is more influential than the, uh, than the power that comes with wealth. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I've said it once and I'll say it again. 
this is a, a, a fight, a royal rumble of epic proportions. <laughs> yeah. Because not only, is, not only are we uh, fighting, royal rumbling, um, uh, market influencer, influencers like the University of Virginia, like digital nomads, mm -hmm. like finance refugees, like people working from ISPs in their basement while earning paychecks in Georgetown and DC as lobbyists and attorneys, fighting the invisible hand of capitalism. Yeah. And I've said twice, I've said many times on this show, the only undefeated team, entity in sports is father time. And the only undefeated team or entity in economics is the invisible hand of capitalism. Show me when that invisible hand has lost. It can be constrained. It can be managed. It can be slowed. But it cannot be stopped. And it's not going to lose. So this is an uphill battle that's It's brutal. Of the silver buckshots that I offered, I'm curious of how six board of supervisors and five city councilors, led by one or two people, galvanized by one or two people, maybe one of them has a massive digital platform that can communicate with the public what the councilors and the supervisors are doing. I wonder what that kind of pressure would do. Yeah. We could help provide that uh, kind of I wonder what that. Well, I wonder pressure. what that would do. Yeah. How would, how would the University of Virginia respond to 11 elected officials working in concert with each other and then that effort clearly spotlighted on a massive platform for the public to engage with and then follow suit? Yeah. Very curious. All right. That's today's show. Um, For those that are watching the program, um, if you have Verizon services down, I have received a direct message um, from someone on Twitter that knows what's up. He says, apparently a construction crew member cut a fiber cable in town that's affecting towers. The oh, Verizon yeah. network is aware and no notice when Verizon cell service will be restored. Um, so if you're a Verizon cell phone user in this area, which I am, you got no cell service right now. It's rough. Dude, <laughs> you know how much time I spent on this thing. This right here is like, an, this is another employee. This is another team member right here. Can't make calls. And the only thing I can do is text people with... Uh, it's like an external organ for you. Uh, yeah. Dude, I spend 10 hours a day on this. Literally. I believe it. No, literally. I, um, I can it. only text people with blue bubbles. I message. When cell service is down, I message is critical. <laughs> if anyone that's not on uh, a blue bubble, an iPhone, I can't text you. Wow. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't, you're not blue bubbles, are you? Are you iPhone? Yeah, I'm iPhone. Okay, you're, you're blue, yeah, you are blue bubbles. I text all the time. That way, that's why I'm texting you. Um, one thing I want to talk about tomorrow is, um, how do these small businesses, uh, thank you, Philip Dow. He said, good show today. Multiple people saying thank good you. show today. Um, I wonder, this is another thing that I was thinking about on the way to work. Has anyone seen Albemarle County and Charlottesville City completely littered with signs along the road? Like we joked about the hangry hut, having yeah, signs everywhere. We've talked about it. And it's not just the hangry hut. I hate to call them out. Right. Because I know they're a small business when owner. I, when I saw their sign, there were at least, I'd say, four or five other signs right there with them. I believe it was on 250, right where, uh, uh, right where um, Hydraulic connects. I saw a five-star painting sign on the way. How does Almoral County and the city of Charlottesville allow small businesses to put all these signs in the ground on their own accord? There's no way they're getting permitting for this signage. 
No, of course They're just not. going and paying whatever the cost is for their signs, burying them in the ground and hoping they don't get caught. And then they, I mean, I do this all the time. They ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Right. But it, 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 it looks trashy and literary. I'd like to know if, uh, if anybody has seen the, the Hangry Hut signs around uh, still. Um, because the ones that I remember the last time I saw them were had to do with the grand opening. And uh, that was weeks ago. Um, I saw a Josh Thronberg, elect Josh Thronberg sign. Wow. How did, how did that get missed? That was from, that's December, January. That's almost 90 days since the election. And the Josh Thronberg sign is still up. Yeah. How is that allowed? I'm, I'm wondering who, go, you know, who's who would inf- to, Who enforces that? Yeah, who would go around and... Uh, you'd have to, you have to keep track of each different kind of sign as well. I mean, you know, drive around town. That's one hangry hut, one Thronberg, one uh, you know whatever. What it, incremental tax revenue, fining people for putting signs all o- all over Charlottesville and Almaro County. There you go. Twenty dollar fine per sign. They are everywhere. And it's the Mayor Giuliani uh, theory. Broken windows breed more broken windows. Those crampy signs in the ground. Are going to make more people put their signs down. Yeah. Like the, the sign that says, we buy houses with cash and then has a phone number. Right. Those things are everywhere. Yeah. And they're predatory. And I've probably, I probably get three or four uh, th- three or four uh, either postcards or... But that's actual- different. That's direct mail. It's, We're it's, in the direct mail business. We do direct mail for our clients. That's different. That's going to someone's mailbox. Yeah, but we don't send out... We don't um, spam people. Yeah. No, but that is different. That's mail. They're paying to create the direct mail, paying for the postage, and sending it to someone's mailbox. What's happening with these signs all around town is the small business owner is just going to a sign company and getting them done. And I bet you they're not even going to a local sign company. They're getting right. them done and they're just bearing, putting them in the ground. Yeah. City of Charlottesville, Elmore County, have someone drive around town and make note of the businesses that have these signs everywhere and, and do a cease and desist at first. Give someone a chance. Better yet, why don't you make it known that this is against the rules? Yeah. Get it far and wide that this is against the rules. And then starting on June 1, we're going to start finding the businesses for doing it. Yeah. Because it's, 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 they're proliferating to the clip of litter. And that impacts quality of life. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I thought you did a great job today. Thank you. Judah Wickhauer, the father of Liza. Um, the voice of a, uh, what, what do we got? Bruce Buffer or a phone sex operator? Which do you prefer? You want to go with Bruce Buffer or Michael Buffer? Sure. Let's go Bruce or Michael Buffer. I think that's a different, a different level of a, can we, can we close with the, uh, the Bruce or Michael Buffer voice of Judah Wickhauer? Sure. What do you want me to say? Anything you want. You get to pick. I don't know. I thought what you were saying before was great. And that folks is the I love Seville show. <laughs> Good job, Judah. Join us tomorrow. <laughs> At what time? 12.30. <laughs> Judah Wickhauer, Jerry Miller, the I Love Seville show on a Thursday presented by the Clifton. My friends, we will see you tomorrow. Take care. <laughs> we should get that somehow when you like, do the intro before the show. That'd be hilarious. And ladies and gentlemen, I can write a script for that. Sure. And ladies and gentlemen. Connie Sylvester says bigger fish to fry again.